what we get as the times go by. So we're kind of going as we go too and learning the character as the episodes come. Um, but other than those two, uh, let's see what else can I tell you. I, I was in Dragon Ball and the original oh. Dragon Ball, I, I believe, before Funimation took over. Yeah. They, they did it in, uh, they did uh, our show at Ocean Sound Studios in Vancouver. And I played, uh, in Dragon Ball, I played a character called um, Lenlia, I think it was in the computer. And Dragon Ball Z, the earlier Dragon Ball Z, one of the earlier ones, I played Chiaotzu. Oh. oh, this is Chiaotzu's voice. Oh, no, everybody. Oh, 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 oh no. Here's Chiaotzu. And uh, Braum and Jink and all kinds of smaller characters. Um, Gundam Wing, which is going to be a panel later on. I played Dorothy Catalonia. Everybody loves Dorothy. Sorry, about that. Is Scott going to be there? I'm sure he is. Scott's everywhere. In fact, I can feel him right now. Look, there he is. It's funny because um, we all work from Vancouver. A lot of the actors are from Vancouver. Here, not so much today. But Scott McNeil and I, um, his first audition was the same first audition for me, which is a show called Kissy Fur. And uh, I auditioned for, it was a very fluffy little cutesy kind of teddy bearish kind of thing. Kissy Fur was a little bear. And uh, it was an interesting kind of... Um, record situation because they were trying to get the show to come up to Canada because it was a little bit better economically and uh, we had to match voices. So there was already a cast who had done the show in LA and they were trying to do a version of it in Vancouver. So my character was a uh, goose called Bessie. And Bessie the goose was like this here and she talked like this and she had, she was a little bit snobby and she always wagged her tail and moved around like this all the time. And it was quite the character. It was the very first audition I had done, too. I don't know what Scott went up for in that show, but that was my first audition, and I was terrified because it wasn't a normal voice, and I did character voicing, but I was new. So I was terrified. I thought, how can I hold this voice, and am I clear enough? And that character, too, now I can do it just like this. But I had to practice it because it was hard to hold. And if you're doing this and you're purposely... I'm popping as a faux pas. If you're doing this and you're just talking like a goose and you have to break your voice all the time, you see, then uh, I thought, please God, let me be able to hold this when I'm actually recording the voice. <laughs> and I was luckily, I luckily I was able to, but then unfortunately the show didn't continue after Aww. all of that. So that's another one that we did way back when, and Scott also, that was his first audition. And let's see, beyond that, so the Gundams, Gundam... Wing. I was Dorothy and Catherine, actually. And that was really interesting to play against uh, Lisa and Belay, who played uh, Rulina in that show. And of course, she was my nemesis, and I was all for war and all pessimistic until it turned around in the end and my father was killed. Yes, yes. And um, I also was in um, Mobile Suit Gundam. I think it was Mobile Suit Gundam. We get them mixed up after White. Yeah, I think it was. And I played many different characters you may not imagine that would be me playing them. I played three little children, and Mariah, I think was her name, and I played Kika, Cats, and Let's, and they were all little kids. I think they were two boys and one girl, and I had to play all of these characters in the same show. So, I was going like that, and I got so awesome, and he's a tall boy, and he's really cool, and stuff like that, and it's so cool, man, like, oh no! Right? Versus, shut up. When do I have to hang with you? Like, you're my totally like, small little brother, like, whatever. Right. We have to do all these characters. So that was in Mobile Suit Gundam, I think. And of course I did the show Cyber Six. I don't know if some of you know that show Cyber Six, but that was a great, great, great show. And it was just one of those things that sort of broke the mold. It was kind of, it looked anime, but it was recorded um, not like an anime session. Most of the anime that we do is recorded like in a lip syncing situation. So we call it a, a animated dialogue replacement or audio digital reproduction. And uh, this one was not that, it was what we call a prelay recording session, which is where you have a script in front of you and you get together with a whole bunch of other actors and a director, and then you record together scene by scene. Whereas in ADR, um, the project has already been recorded in the host country. Mostly it's in Japanese, but we have done other countries too. And then we're doing an English version, right? So uh, Cyber 6 was a prelay. It was not a lip sync, it was original. Uh, and it looked very European, but it was a co-production with TMS, and the Canadian company was NOAA. So we had everybody involved, and it was a really awesome show. I really, uh, my voice for her was simply here. A promise is a promise to you, ma'am. You know, it was just me with a little bit of brevity in there, so that was another show. 
Um, I also played uh, Young Trunks in one of the Dragon Ball Z's, and man, oh man, talk about working out. I'm up there with Goten or Goku or one of the G words. We <laughs> <laughs> all blend together after one. And then in the scenes where we're just sitting there doing this. <laughs> fighting, 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 and I'm like, oh man, I gotta get sleep for this show. It was so action oriented. We're falling down hills and rolling down hills and we're punching each other out, and I'm like, oh man. It's my initiation for the boy voice. But the funny part about the boy voice was that when I started out, like brand, brand new, new voice actor, I thought, okay, I'm going to try to see if I can do boy voices too, because I know that those are good to do. And, everything. and I started to try the boy voice, and uh, I'm like, so proud of you, you know? I didn't go to the side the boy voice, right? And my friend says to me, Kat, that's really good. That's a really awesome female crow. And I'm like, that's not a crow. It's not female. It's my boy voice. It's like, now I know better, right, doing all the boys I do. Uh, let's see, so after that, uh, this is not necessarily in order, um, I did something called Project Arms as well, and I played a character, I think her name was um, Midori and Koizumi. Again, I mean, they're all blending. Amazoni Koku, Amazoni Koko, and Project Arms too is a different uh, character. Yeah, the Sakus. I mean, they just all blend. Uh, and then, of course, Death Note. Death Note was another yeah. show for me where I played Nier. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you no, know, that was a really bizarre thing because for me, I came in, I was cast for the show, Nier's still like that. He's talking about Lighty Gummy and whether or not, you know, uh, El was killed and I have to take over. What is the, uh, if you can't solve the problem, then you're a loser. You know, this kind of <laughs> stuff. You're just sitting there like that with his toys all the time, like just really, really weird and, you know, talking like this and, <laughs> that was me and elementary school. It didn't take a lot of exercise or energy for that one in particular, but it was really intelligent. I would say Death Note was one of the shows that really hit the mark on depth. You know, it was really mm -hmm. interesting, it was kind of psychological, and you had to get really into it, it was kind of dark, and, and that was really awesome. But it was hard for me in a way because I came in at episode 26. <laughs> And I'm like, what's this? What? The, what? What's the background? What's going on so far? Oh my gosh! You know, oh no. And then I had to like, figure it out and find out what's going on, and then jump in from there. So that was near. Uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, one of the. I mean, I'm in shows right now. I'm in a show called Kid vs. Cat, which is airing all over the place. I play another boy voice, Dennis. Uh, and um, Robot is a Canadian production we've done, and. Uh, I can't talk about something else I'm recording right now. And then, of course, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic just went cuckoo and is going cuckoo. And that's like, yeah. So that's so awesome, you guys. Like, it's so awesome Like when I get to go totally to convention that there's no other ponies, right? And I'm like, I don't know what to do, because uh, like, I'm the number one assistant, right? And I just, I don't know, there's no books, and Twilight's not around, and I haven't come across any gemstones yet either, so. Getting kind of hungry. Carolyn's gonna love this. Spike has got to be one of my favorites now too. How can it be? So I'm here to answer questions for you guys. I mean, I could ramble on till a term eternity because we're voice actors and that's kind of what we do. Um, but if you have questions too, I'd be happy to answer them. Or I can talk about different talk topics like voiceover and how to get into it, or what it's like in the studio. I mean, it is always so much fun in the studio because we're hanging out with our family of actors. Uh, you know, Scott and I have done shows in the past, like way back to something called Double Dragon years and years ago. Oh my gosh, I played a cop in that one. Jeez, yeah, that was like ages ago. And that was just me, like, oh man, the fact that you know that show is scaring me a bit. <laughs> Are you a big Ocean Group fan? Oh, we've done so much. I mean, I can't even, I can't even tell you all the stuff we've done. Like, the listener, we only put so much on our resume, but... Goes back. You had a question off the bat there? Are you looking forward to Canterlot Gardens? I can't wait for Canterlot Gardens. It's another pony convention. In Ohio, everybody, again, we're going to be in Cleveland. We're looking so, forward to having you there. Yeah, we look, we look forward to it too. All of us, a lot of us will be there. I won't say all of us, but a lot of us will be there. Yeah. We're going to gallop over there in another two and a half weeks. I think it's the last weekend of September we're going to be there. So, uh, But yeah, it's uh, been a fabulous career and I. I just can't believe I'm doing all these cons now. I've done some cons in the past, but with My Little Pony taking off, it's been so great to meet everybody. And I know some of you don't have a clue probably what the bronies are, but most people do. <laughs> Hail to the bronies. So, did you have a question? Did you put your hand in the question here? Did you? Oh. 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 
Uh, Go for it. Uh, yeah. One thing that I always try to ask a lot of voice actors is, is were you, did you originally plan on going into voice acting specifically, or was your uh, original goal for live action acting? Um, in my, it's different in everybody's case completely. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, I didn't even know what voiceover was. I, Leo, what's up? Uh, oh, okay. Because I set out, I didn't quite know exactly what I wanted to do, but I had a few ideas. Um, I, my background is I have a Bachelor of Music degree and a minor in Sociology. And when I was, I got this from Ontario, I'm born in Toronto, and I moved out to Vancouver many, many years ago. And um, I thought that I would probably end up being a film and TV documentary composer, because I wanted to combine my music with something really meaningful. Um, but at the same time, all my professors at my university were like, you should be a psychologist, because I was acing all my social courses and everything. And I find it also really interesting. If people have followed me on Twitter or know a bit about me, I love this guy, and I'm really into human nature and how we interact. So um, I didn't know, no, acting was not on my radar. But in my university, they had a co-op program, um, which was a radio and television kind of thing. It was a co-op program with the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, through the school. It was like a work term for either third or fourth year or whatever, and I applied for it. By the time I got to it, um, the CBC was going to shut down that program because um, they were very, very busy and some students were very committed and others weren't. So going, I did that work term, that co-op program, and that got me up to Vancouver on a two-year contract as an associate producer uh, in radio music, the radio music department. And when I was working as an associate producer with the host of the show, Jürgen Goth, who got me into this, so my heart goes out to Jürgen, um, he said, you've got a really nice voice. Have you ever thought of doing commercials or any voiceover work? And I said, voice, what? Over, what is it? You know, and he said, no, seriously, I'll help you put a little demo together. And if you want, come and do some commercials with me for at CHQM, which was a different station. So I said, oh, okay. So he helped me put together a little demo. And one of my engineers, um, John Germanis, who's a dear friend and my assistant from the workshops that I do, uh, is still working with me today. Uh, he said, you should do this. And I thought, it was a lot. You know, I thought this was funny, quite a hobby, you know. And then I ended up send, you know, sending a demo around about an agent. And strangely, I did, I started off with radio commercials, which was not animation. And then um, started to get into animation, and I was doing really well there. So that's how that kind of came about. I didn't expect it at all. And then the other voiceover arenas opened up too, like um, video games came into play, narration. For documentaries, all that came into play. I just ended up doing it all, and I started to cast and direct back mm -hmm. in the day too. So I did a stint, several years of casting and directing on different shows while I was acting and others, and that was fun. We got to work with some of the great directors, American directors like Gordon Hunt mm -hmm. and Andrea Romano and Susan Blue. They all came up too. So that's how I kind of. It's a long-winded answer, but mm -hmm. after that, quite honestly, I did. Uh, I succeeded. and I did really well in the first cartoon I did. And that was, and it kind of dried up. I said, oh, okay, you know, I'll finish my CBC contract, and I don't know if I'll stay. And then I thought, maybe I will go into psychology. Maybe I'll go do that, go back and get my master's. And then, boom, I got three series in a row. Wow. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm not doing this again. <laughs> and I kept putting it down, I'm putting it down, and they're like, what? You're coming back to Ontario, aren't you? Not yet. <laughs> so here I am still out in the West Coast. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, you mentioned Andre Romano, mm -hmm. who's uh, been associated with basically most of the uh, Warner Brothers animated uh, adaptations of the DC characters. Have you act actually ever done one of the hero shows? Um, I'm trying to remember, you know, again, to be honest with you, the, the, the directors and the shows are all mixing and matching. We did a show, this was a Susan, Susan Blue called Stone Protectors. And um, I was one of the leads in that. But there was also Andrea Romano, I'm trying to remember now, I think she did a show called The Littlest, Littlest Pet Shop. I think the original, one of the original Littlest Pet Shops, Andrea did. And I did a few voices in that, as did Lee Toker, and I'm sure Scott. I mean, we were, Lee came in a little bit after. Um, but I can't read, if you name them, I can tell you if I was in them. That's, that's what it boils down to. Well, I know one of the Canadian actors that came to the US is Tara Strong. Yeah. And you do the oh, My Little Pony show with her. Yep. I was wondering maybe if, if hearing that name might ring a bell for something you might have done in the 90s or early 21st century. I haven't worked with um, with Tara, but um, like I know that was ringing a bell, but um, 
you know, my, the, the resume is literally down the street and out the door. And, uh, I kind of block them out as I go, but uh, I mean, I did a He-Man. Uh, I was too in He-Man. Um, I just sort of try to remember the ones that I that that are popular, kind of, like the real, real popular ones. But I and I've done guest stars in, in Little Corduroy, and you know, and uh, well, there's there's Mega Man, but there's all the um, I've I've done bits and pieces in the big shows too. I'm just trying, I'm blanking out, unfortunately. I'll have to go look at my resume and get back to you. <laughs> right now, I'm phoning out, but it's a uh, uh, we did we did so much back then, and I was mixing and matching with casting and directing. And the ADR came up in the in the '90s, the early '90s as well, and that took off. In fact, we started with a lot of the European stuff, and we did we did French and British and Spanish and all kinds of different things, and then it just went into the Japanese the whole thing just took over, and that's what the majority was. So. Yes. Was it difficult thing to fight? Say that again, sorry? Was it difficult thing to fight? Yeah. Uh, you know what? N yes and no. I've done so many um, boy voices now in my career, different ranges, different types, and I've sung a lot too, so I'm used to holding it, but the challenge with Spike or any sort of young boy voice too, or even the lower ones, is to, you've got to sustain the voice of Spike, but then you've got to stay in tune and still have some kind of personality. So with the other ponies, even they're, they're, the other ponies are pretty much in their own range and are just souping it up a little bit, whereas I'm actually having to change my entire personality and persona. They do too when they're acting, but I mean, I'm going into the boy. So it, it, it's pretty challenging. And, and one of the things is that you have to make sure that, you know, if the song is actually written in your range. And Daniel Ingram is so, so great. I mean, I just love his music. It's a perfect fit for pony. So. Oh no, she wasn't. You know? I can't keep her waiting. She didn't say much of those things, but if I'm talking like that, um, yeah, so I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. What a glorious feeling. I'm happy again. A lot of time uh, I sang in a show um, called The Runaway Rainbow, and I actually played Rarity, a Rarity character. It's a My Little Pony show. Uh, and, I, and she was not the rarity at all that we see today. She was a little baby pony, and she was just so intent on making uh, rain, her rainbows, making rainbows was her job, and she was a very little girl. And so I had to sing in this show, and while I was singing, I had to like roll into the flowers and fall down the hill and slip into this and slip into that. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I said, could I please see the story, the storyboards to the director, which are the pages? Because like I, I flip on that word and I twist on that word and I sing on this word. And after a while I was like, oh no. So I got to see it and then. And, and she was just talking like that. She, Rarity was up here and she was just, really? That is so cool. I really, really love rainbows. You know, so it's kind of. Oh, look at that. Here comes the sunshine. I think it's so awesome, isn't it? Wow, look at that rainbow. And I always like to bug Andrea Lippman, who's a, who's a dear, dear friend and buddy of mine, because she plays Fluttershy and Pinkie Pie on the show. And I was going, oh, look at that. It's so nice you could all come. And she's like, don't go there. That's my character. <laughs> I'm like, it always will be. I can't do it. And it is fantastic. So I said, well, it could be one of your second cousins once removed or something. And I'm like, yes. I have two questions. Uh, my first question was, did you originally want to be Spike, or did you want to be one of the um, because when we go to do a show, we, we have, uh, if we're multi-voiced types of actors, then we do try out whatever the spectrums are for us. There's, I know now very, very well, as do a lot of the casting people, where my placement is. So it wasn't like I was wanting that role or wanting that role. It was like, here's all the roles I can play, and I'll audition for all of them and see what is right. But, you know, Spike certainly stood stood out. Because he's this cute little purple and green guy, and he's, he's not a pony, and you know, so I was really happy to get him. Yeah, and as I said before in other conventions and other interviews, I, I they they called him a baby dragon. He's like a baby dragon, so I thought, oh well, he's like really really a baby. Um, so when I started the spike, I made him much younger at first, and so he was like that. He was kind of awesome. And, no way, seriously. Oh, cool, awesome, right? I added a little bit more, a little bit more boy in there because otherwise it'll sound like a girl. But she just had to play with him. She's got to make it like that and keep it there and hold it like that, right? 
that's a younger spike. But they're like, no, 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 we want him older. Oh, so you want him about here? No, we still want him older. Oh, so you want him down here a bit? Yeah, yeah, that's more like it, and more boy. Yeah, whatever. All right. <laughs> okay. Donuts! <laughs> so then we found the placement. And they always take about three shells or so before they find where the fit is. Okay, that's where the fit is, right? And Andrea, like, I don't sit right beside Andrea. I sit, I usually sit or stand. I stand usually beside her, um, And then if um, Nicole Oliver comes in and has a role as a uh, celestial, she usually stands on the right. And then it's um, Andrea. Oh, that's and, uh, Okay, good. So I don't get I don't get uh, Andrea's squeeze or Pinkie Pie squeals in my ear all of a sudden. And we all, it's so funny because we know when she's going to go off, right? Because we see it coming in the script, right? And when she's going to go off, we just kind of like, like this, or we, we pluck our ears and she's looking around like, okay, you guys. <laughs> but the engineers are so great because they know when they have to pull down the microphones and watch for it. Right? It's a really fun time. We have a good time. Yes, sir. What is your um, favorite role then in your entire career? Well, I, I, I have three now. There was shampoo. Hi, y'all, Oh, I must be your favorite. <laughs> um, and then it kind and then Cyber Six really was such a great role for me because the women don't get those kinds of juicy meaty roles um, often. You know, we're not usually the lead characters with that kind of dimension and depth. And the interesting thing about that show was I got to use my own natural voice. And also, you know, it was like a drama. It was like a movie in a way. So you got to, if you're, if you're the lead character, then you, you get to develop your character quite nicely uh, in every single episode. And so I was able to get into those levels. You know, it was more emotional. And she had this struggle between being human and part cyber and having to get this green goo called sus sustenance. If she didn't get this green goo, then she would die. She was created by a, created in a lab by a mad scientist. And she was one of those things that went wrong. So she would be the other one. And of course, Spike now is growing on me like crazy. I mean, he always was during the finale. Because also through the episodes, his personality has grown too. And so I got to see him in my Hell's Well that ends well. It was my favorite episode still, just because I get to open up a little bit. And that was the first time we got to see his character really in some kind of emotional struggle that he might be rejected from Twilight. And it was interesting to see that. Fun for me, because I went through all these emotions, you know? And he's looking at the owl and it's like, uh, excuse me, Spike? Like, uh, that's, dude, that's creepy. Yeah. Yes? Do you have an ad lib or improvise lines? Uh, we really, we really can't in a pre-light show, um, or any show, um, because the writers are just so fantastic, too. Like, I have to say in this show, I want to necessarily say especially, but Megan McCarthy and her team are unbelievable. And they know our characters so well that it's almost like when we read this, it's exactly what we would say. So it's just so smooth and it's just so flowing and it's just so easy. So we don't add it because it's a writer's thing too. We have to stick to the script. But we are giving some license to chuckle or laugh into it or read into it, that kind of thing, but we don't add it. I might say something at the beginning of my line like, listen. I tried and tried and tried, but I'm gonna run out of gemstones. You can only eat donuts for so long, okay? And it doesn't, they're kind of stale, right? So I can go, listen, or look, or, you know, I can say stuff like that on occasion, but they still like you to stay pretty close to it. Even if I throw that in, sometimes they don't want you to do that. So the rule is not to. Yes? Uh, has there ever been a job that you turned down because you thought it was going outside your comfort zone? No, and um, despite what IMDb has said about me turning down a Cyber Six role originally or something, it's, it was on IMDb or Wikipedia or something, I was like, what? I never wrote that, so never, ever, ever. I mean, it's all work for us and they're all different challenges for us, so I would never turn down. The only thing I would say I would not go out for is something that's really viable. And there are certain video games, one that I auditioned for and got, but we did not see the specs of it. We had no idea what it was going to be like. And I played the Queen of the Elves. And it was very Tolkien-esque. Tolkien-esque. I just love the Tolkien stuff. I'm a nerd. I'm a Tolkien nerd. I don't know all the details too much and everything like that. So don't start quizzing me or nothing. <laughs> but um, it's real fun. I enjoy it so much. I can't even tell you. I can't. I can't. I can't tell you. Next question. 
director and director. Um, they, what happens is the casting director, get, they sort of get to know you over time, and they only have a certain length of time to be able to get out of you what they need. So they have to kind of hone into your personality very quickly. You as the actor has to come in as prepared as you can, first of all. So the director then is only really working with what you're bringing them, and then moving it around and changing it to what they know they need. So. Um, Really, respect for the actor from a casting and directing is really important. And allowing, you know, the, the poor casting directors and directors, they only have so much time to get what they need. So they're, they're you, you're slotted. So to get to what you need to do, if you're talking about casting directors and directors' perspective, is to um, get what you need quickly and treat everybody with respect, which everyone does. Um, really have a handle on what you need to relay to the actor. Because sometimes that's hard for directors and casting people too, because they get information from the clients, and sometimes that changes midstream, and they're trying to relay that to you, the actor. So um, other do's and don'ts from a casting director director's perspective would just be to focus, to get, you know, try to find from that actor as quickly as you can what you need from them and how to get that. You learn that very quickly, and to you have to watch basic things like clarity, energy making it visual your read, like the reactions, and taking directions the number one thing as a voice actor that you need to do. And not popping, and I'm popping a lot on this one, because it's kind of a wind sock. I don't have a wind sock. Pop. <laughs> we had to do babies the other day. I, I tend to be the infant. I, I you know, go, hi, caught this thing? But <laughs> so they get me to do newborns for some reason. I'm also the whistle girl, but I need two hands to do that. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Um, where were you at, like, in your thoughts when uh, um, the D Dragon Ball Z? Texas, like, right, the chefs and stuff. How, how did you react when that happened? Oh, well, we were just really disappointed. We, we never know the reasoning behind it as the actors. We just kind of commit to the shows we have, and we hope they go on, you know, for 25 years. Which they never do. But, you know, we really hope so. We were disappointed, but it's usually just business reasons and economy and proximity and things like that. And back in the day when we really started, um, it's amazing how much I blank out after all the years and just focus on the media. But really, the American oh, it's you. The directors from the states came up. You guys came up. I mean, sort of, tra you trained us. American directors trained us about pre-laid recording and how to do it. I mean, that ADR was Dragon Ball Z, but still, um, I think it was growing so much that um, it moved to different location. Um, yeah, it's, it was disappointing for us, for sure, because it became so popular, but we never really do know the reasons. And at least for myself, I'm grateful for the length of time we do have it. Yeah, there's a lot of disappointments. Like, Cyber 6 was a big disappointment that didn't continue. They left the end um, episode hanging. You know, so we all thought maybe it was going to come back, and uh, ourselves as well. Right? So, Because you get attached to it. Um, yeah, go ahead. On the other hand, sometimes it's better to leave it hanging, considering what happens with a lot of movie sequels when it's, when they pick up 20 years oh, after the last film was right. released. Right, or leaving something when it's at its, its peak. Mm -hmm. That one, it's, yeah, it's like, like uh, Seinfeld or whatever, you know, eventually left. Yeah, Jones. yeah. You had a question? Yeah, I um, since you said you're from Vancouver and Tony from Hampro, where do you guys do the way back there? We do the voice acting in Vancouver. Everybody, me, and uh, Andrea Women, and uh, Tabitha Pentamine, and Effie Ball, and 
shining armor. And um, I can't do exactly him, right? <laughs> 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 